The Lord be with you. I want to take a moment as you're turning, as Levi's running, uh, to Isaiah chapter 2, to just say a word of thanks to Peggy McAllister and the worship committee and all of you who volunteered to be a part of this morning's service. I always look forward to it, uh, one, because more of you get to see what it's like to stand up here, uh, and because it's, it's always great, and I want you to hear me say this, when those of us who are, for lack of a better word, paid to be up here, um, get to see more of you who aren't paid to be up here, to be a part of the worship service. It's always uh, moving to me, so thank you. Well, this morning on the first Sunday of Advent, we listen to the second chapter, the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, May we hear what you would have us to hear. Your words, not mine. May we do what it is you call us to do. Your will, and not our own. That we may be the people, Lord, you call us to be. People of faith. So speak to us now, Holy Spirit, we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, one of my favorite movies is a movie from 1997, an Italian film written and directed by Roberto Benigni. It's a movie about a husband and wife who own a little bookshop, and together they have a son. But it's during their son's, I think it's his fifth birthday party, that the story takes a dark turn. For the first few minutes of the film, it seems like it's a nice little love story about a man who courts a woman and they settle down, and they get married, and they open the little bookshop. But it takes place in Italy in the early 1940s, during World War II. And this man, Guido, his uncle, Elisio, his wife, Dora, and their son, Joshua, are Jews. Guido, Elisio, and Joshua are arrested during Joshua's birthday party and forced on a train bound for a concentration camp. And when Dora hears of their capture and is assured that that is where they are, she volunteers to board a train headed for the same camp just to be near her family. But it isn't long after the men arrive that Guido's uncle is sent to the gas chamber. That Joshua avoids the gas chamber because he doesn't like to take showers and all the little kids were getting in line to take showers and he didn't want to take a shower. The terrors of the camp become real really fast. But Guido does his best to protect his son from them, to give him hope amid such horror. And so he tells his son that they're actually a part of this great, complicated game. And in order to win the grand prize, his very own military tank, Joshua must do everything his father tells him to do. So Guido uses his imagination and charm to convince his son to hide, to be quiet, to stay out of sight of guards and even prisoners, even if they called his name. To stay out of sight. That's how he was earned points to win the prize. Well, eventually, news reaches the camp that the Allies have won and are on their way to liberate the camp. So the Nazis begin to abandon the place, burn records, burn corpses. They begin executing prisoners. The place is wild with the sound of dogs barking, guns firing, men and women screaming for one another. 
And so Guido takes his son Joshua and convinces him to hide in what looks like a little mailbox. He tells him, you've won, son, but in order to get the prize, in order to do this, to claim it, you've got to stay right here. You've got to hide until I come get you. So as Joshua hides in the box, Guido heads to the other side of the camp, dresses himself like a woman, and in hope to find his wife, Dora, when he's captured by a Nazi soldier. The soldier leads him at the end of a rifle in front of the box where Joshua is hiding. And after looking over and making eye contact with his son, Guido winks at him and mockingly marches in front of the box. The soldier leads him around the corner, and we see them go down an alley, and we hear the rifle fire. It's one of the most heartbreaking scenes I've ever seen in a movie. Yet it's also a powerful image of hope. Of hope. Because you see, hope, hope is most keenly felt by those who are broken. By those at the end of the line. By those who would otherwise have nothing left to call them on. After all, what good is hope if you're eating high on the hog? If you're living in the mansion, got the nice car outside and not a care in the world, what good is hope then? It's most keenly felt by those at the end. So Guido's hope was for his son, not for himself. A hope in what lies beyond the terror of a concentration camp. A hope for what waits in the unforeseen future. A hope that is bigger than the present and even bigger than our very selves. It's that kind of hope that we celebrate on this first Sunday of Advent. It's the kind of hope of which the prophet Isaiah speaks in our text this morning. Isaiah talks about what will happen in days to come. But at the time the prophet first spoke those words, the days to come seemed bleak. The nation was on the brink of destruction. God was calling them out for their iniquities through the prophet. They had been greedy, absorbed in their own self-interest. Those in power had been corrupted. And the religion of the day was little more than just lip service and habitual ritual. You going up to the temple? Yes, temple day. Got to go up to the temple. Going to make my little offering. Going to show my face in front of folks. That's all it was. Just fake. Sounds a bit familiar, I suppose. The Lord had threatened to pour out his wrath on the people, to turn his hand against them. God was angry with the nation because it had forgotten its calling, overlooked the teachings of the Torah to find power, wealth, and prominence among the nation. There was even political political tension in the atmosphere as the Syro-Ephraimitic War had been raging, creating or catching the southern kingdom of Judah and its capital Jerusalem in the crossfire. The days to come seemed filled with fear, anxiety, and uncertainty as the Lord's wrath seemed imminent, and the world around them just spun out of control. And yet the prophet says, In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be raised above the hills, and the nations, all the nations, shall stream to it. Here the world is falling apart and things seem terrible, but now the prophet is talking about a future when the Lord's house will be set on the highest mountain and every nation will flow to it like an ever-growing stream of living souls. Doesn't he know what's going on in the world? I mean, has Isaiah even bothered to look out the window, to crawl out from whatever rock he is under, to read a paper, to turn on the news, check his Facebook? It's horrible. It's horrible out there. Markets are crashing. Wars are raging. People are rioting in the streets. It's a mad world. But all he can say is, in the days to come, the Lord's house will be on the highest mountain. And everybody's going to want to go there. He's daydreaming. Got his head in the clouds. He's preaching on and on about a day unforeseen, about a hope that is to come then. But what everybody wants to know is what about now? That's true, isn't it? We all want to know about right now. What about now? Oh, sure, it's nice to daydream about the future, to sing about the sweet by and by, but what are we supposed to do 
now, now. I can remember many times when I was a kid. I'd wake up some nights and I could see down the hallway that the light was on in the kitchen. My mom and my stepdad were sitting at the table. One of them would have the checkbook while the other sorted through a stack of envelopes on the table. It was a regular sort of ritual in our house growing up, something I come to find as I become an adult. The poorer you are, the more often the bills come. And I can remember a few times when some of those envelopes were pink or they were stamped with red ink. My mom and my stepdad would look worried, maybe overwhelmed. And so I'd ask my mom, uh, Mama, is, is everything all right? And Mama would say to me every single time, Everything is going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Not, yes, baby, it is all right. But it's going to be all right. My mama didn't know she was a prophet. Still doesn't know. She spoke about an unforeseen future. Days to come when paying bills would be easier, when the envelopes wouldn't stack up, when decisions would be made about which pair of shoes to buy rather than which bills to pay. It was as if she said, it's not all right now, but it will be one day. That's how I imagine people heard the words from Isaiah. <laughs> After all, when you read them, they're pretty far-fetched notions when they're weighed on the scales of reality. The prophet speaks about a day when many people shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God, that, we may, that He may teach us His ways and that we may walk in His paths. A day when people will want to go to the house of God. And get this, not just go to be entertained, but to learn. People who call themselves religious hardly have the time or want to take the time these days to get out of bed. And go learn about their faith, their God. But Isaiah, Isaiah is telling us there's coming a day when many people will want to go and learn. And from God, God's self, no less. Isaiah also says that God will be the ultimate judge of the nations. Now, now before too many of you go getting all left behind crazy on us, uh, let me explain what he means. You see, that notion... That Isaiah says, when, God, when Isaiah says, God shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many people, what the prophet means is that God will be the one who dissolves disputes, cancels conflicts, wipes away the need for war. It's gone. This isn't the apocalyptic judge we've painted in our imagination, wielding a gavel in one hand and a thunderbolt in the other, waiting to send all of those people to hell and all of us to carry on and join the hereafter. This is a God who acts as judge in order not to bring harshness, but to bring peace. I mean, just look at the result of such judgment from God, according to the prophet. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, the prophet says, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war. Anymore. Nations, Isaiah says, will stop spending trillions of dollars on weapons and war and will instead spend such resources on those things which help rather than harm. You mean to tell me, I want to ask, you mean to tell me when God judges the nations, armies are going to put down their weapons, convert them into farming implements? And folks who once fought each other, soldiers who once studied the strategies and tactics of warfare, will now seek to live in peace with one another while learning to walk in the path of God from God Almighty himself. You mean to tell me that the young men and women will no longer be sent to fight the wars of the wealthy, that religion will no longer be warped as a justification for bloodshed and violence, that young children will no longer have to live in fear of bombs falling on them in hospitals, that the hunger for oil will no longer drive the will to fight, and the boundaries we so foolishly fight over will one day be erased? That's what you're telling me? And here I thought my mama was being naive when she used to tell me everything's going to be all right. How in the world 
How in the world can the prophet Isaiah speak about such wide-eyed, foolhardy notions when his world is crumbling around him? How can we read such words in worship in such a world where the news in our papers, on our televisions, in our social media reminds us daily of just how messed up it all is, of just how upside down the whole world is? How can we sit in this room in November of 2016 and decorate it with green garland, purple pyramids, candles, magi, shepherds, Mary, Joseph? How can we do that? I'll tell you how. Because we have hope. We have hope. We have a hope that is greater than any single one of us. A hope that is greater than anything in this whole universe or if you'd like this whole multiverse. We have an eternal hope. A hope that says every time it's going to be all right. Not because we're foolishly optimistic. But not because we're unsure of what the future holds. But because, as the old song says, we know who holds the future. We have the kind of hope that makes us want to decorate a tall tree with red flowers and and hang wreaths in the windows. We have the kind of hope that we want to tell on the mountain. The kind of hope that calls us to love others even though they may be our enemies. Because we trust that one day, one day we'll beat those swords into plowshares. The kind of hope that says... That the kindness we show today is worth something because it has ripples on into eternity. The kind of hope that calls us to the great mountain of God. A mountain higher than all mountains. Where all the nations will flow like an ever growing stream of souls to learn the ways of the Lord and walk in God's paths. So friends, on this first Sunday of Advent, The prophet calls to the house of Jacob with such words of hope that I call to you. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let us look forward not only to the arrival of the Christ child at Christmas, but to those days to come when everything's going to be all right. When our hope will be realized. When many will say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God, that we may learn his ways and walk in his paths. When the Lord shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many people. When the great militaries of this world shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, when they shall learn war no more. Oh, church, come. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. And let us have hope. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God of love, God of hope, help us, Lord, to see that in the end, Everything is going to be all right. That in the days to come, your kingdom will be fully realized. And that we will rejoice in the full sight of your presence. Help us, Lord, not to just talk about such things in such seasons, in such places as this. But help us, Lord, to live as if we truly believe them. To live empowered by your Holy Spirit, to love Lord, to share, to be people who live with that great hope. So Holy Spirit, speak to us now. Move in our presence that we may feel you among us and respond to your presence however you would have us to do. In your name we pray. Amen.